Are we going to be going into the century of the CCP or are we going to be going into the century of freedom? What kind of future will the youth be looking at when it comes to America? Will America be in decline or escalate further into warfare? Or will we find a way out? Today, we have a former Navy Intel officer and podcast host, Jack Basovic, who will be discussing with us the direction our current political class is heading for and how the external factors can affect our policy towards the world. The idea of America going into decline, that, that's kind of freaks me out, I'm not gonna lie. American culture is stagnated, right? There's a reason that everything Hollywood culture tur turns out now is either a remake or a reboot right. or a sequel oh. or a prequel or something that's remake, right? Because our culture is in stagnancy right now, the same way that we're experiencing stagflation in the economy. So let's dive a little further and see why Jack is a real American game changer. Well, Jack Vesovic, I'm so happy for you to join us here on American Game Changers in the APOC Times. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for having me on today. I really appreciate it. So, you know, I was we were talking a little bit. Always got to throw out a little Mandarin for my APOC Times folks. Absolutely. I'm sure there will be a lot of people that love that. Uh, so, you know, thank you for joining again for our show. And, you know, I first heard about you mostly through Twitter. And I follow you and you really, a lot of breaking news. I'll see a lot of things that you break. But before Twitter, before it all, can you give us a little brief background on yourself and uh, how you got started? Yeah, sure, no, I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, originally I was uh, uh, coming up out of Pen I'm from the Pennsylvania area. So um, just outside Philadelphia where I grew up, went to school in Philadelphia. Then right after that, uh, ended up moving to China, specifically Shanghai, lived there for about two years was working in international business as well as a stint at the Shanghai American Chamber of Commerce. Um, learned to speak, read, write Mandarin while I was there at uh, Huatong Shifan Daxue, uh, East China Normal University. And uh, coming back from Shanghai, I, you know, I was kind of given this choice at one point, right? It was like, do you want to go into international business and make all this money, but at the same time, you know, kind of essentially have to go along with the CCP and uh, you know, I saw a lot of people that, you know, that I had known colleagues of mine who went along with that and said, yeah, we're, you know, we're going to get filthy rich, uh, helping to build the Shanghai Disneyland and, you know, working with all these huge big name, big brand companies, working Chinese movies. I was actually in a movie when I was in China, believe it or not, uh, with, uh, with Jackie Chan and Jet Li, um, because they were looking for Americans at one point. So wow. I just kind of went out for it in Shanghai. <laughs> and so it's, uh, it's called the Forbidden Kingdom. It's the only movie where Jackie Chan and Jet Li actually fight each other. So I'm I'm in there. I've got a speaking I think role. I've seen that actually. Small role, but it's a speaking role. But yeah, I wanted to. I said, no, I want to do something more. I want to, you know, take all this knowledge and this information that I have, I've gleaned and learned about uh, about China, the experiences that I've had, and do something with it. So I came home to the United States and ended up joining the U.S. military, specifically the Navy, and uh, went into Navy intelligence and served there uh, eight years as an uh, first intelligence analyst, then an intelligence officer, predominantly focusing on CCP. Um, and was also able to use my Mandarin skills as a, you know, as essentially as a way to be a linguist, uh, even though I, 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 I hesitate when I say that because there's specific, you know, cryptographic interpreters in the Navy, but uh, I wasn't the guy doing translations all day long because I just I didn't want to do that job. Um, so I wanted to be someone that was actually there writing the reports, figuring out what was going on uh, with the CCP and with the People's Liberation Army in, uh, in East Asia and Asia Pacific. So that being said, I, you know, I could also have that ability to use my, my Mandarin ability um, when I was conducting my, my assessments and my intel. Uh, so multiple deployments there throughout East Asia, as well as one deployment on the counterterrorism desk at, um, at Guantanamo Bay. And then uh, really in 2016 is, uh, like you said, through social media that started taking off and um, you know, kind of found my way into doing independent media. And that's where I found myself today. That's beautiful. That's really nice. So what got you really interested and what made you want to go to China and what got you interested into like foreign affairs and the international scene? Well, I've always been interested in politics in general. And I remember back in the early 2000s, you know, if you remember back then, the Iraq war is in full swing. We're talking 2005, 2006, pre-surge, um, you know, 24 is the hottest show on television. We're only a couple of years away from 9-11. And at the same time, I remember... I just kept hearing that, you know, everything about China, right? China's ascent to the WTO, it just happened. Uh, you know, we're signing all these new trade deals with China. China is China going to get most favored nation status, right? All of this stuff was going on. 
And I remember looking at the situation, I was still in college at the time, but I remember looking at it saying, you know, I think this war on terror stuff is probably something that, you know, will be big right now. But I think long term that China is a much greater issue and a much greater competitor and the CCP, particularly as an adversary for the United States and for the West. And I think that's going to be a greater long term situation. And so when all of my you know, my friends in foreign, uh, you know, foreign relations, relations courses were studying Arabic and Turkish. I said, no, I want to go study Mandarin. I want to go move to China. I think that is going to be, you know, really the test of our time for at least my lifetime. And here we are 15 years later and I'm still talking about it. It's very, very interesting. So fast forward to today and everything that's going on. What's happening right now in Ukraine is is it's kind of alarming. So can you give us a little update? Uh, I know there was a press conference just earlier today. Um, tell us a little bit about that. So President Zelensky came out earlier today with this press conference and very diplomatically, but you know, reading between the lines on this, he's slamming President Biden. He said, look, I'm the president of Ukraine. I know what's going on here. I am based here. We do not think that there is an imminent invasion that's coming. He actually attacked Western media at one point. He said, you know, you are creating a panic. You're creating a false impression that there's tanks in the streets and people are fleeing their homes. It's just not happening. He also even pointed out um, and, you know, again, reading the, the tea leaves a little bit here, he said he, he, he was trying to kind of, you know, have his cake and eat it, too, because he was saying, you know, he was praising President Biden. Of course, he doesn't want to blow up his relationship with the United States. I mean, that would be ridiculous. But at the same time, he's saying, I think Biden's intermediaries, these intelligence services, these natural national security agencies, they need to work together better because it, it essentially it sounded like he's getting intel from his people that are right there on the border telling them what's going on with these Russian troop movements. And then he gets on the phone to President Biden and Biden's telling them a completely separate story about how Kiev is about to be. And we got this readout from the call last night that was held between Biden and Zelensky saying Kiev is about to be sacked. Uh, the Russians are just waiting for those those muddy, you know, muddy grounds to be frozen over. And then the tanks are going to roll in. And Zelensky is saying, look, you know, we're, we're just not seeing that. So I, I don't know where this is coming from. What do you think this is? Who's pushing this? So I saw you tweeted earlier that like 31 percent of Americans didn't support having troops there. Or so it sounds like most of the country does not want to have U.S. troops get involved or even go into a wars like situation. Who do you think is pushing, you know, and who's giving this bad information to Biden? Well, it's really an interesting situation, right, because when it really is one of those ones where the elites get to run the wars, but the soldiers that go over and fight are the sons and daughters of the American people, the working people, the middle class. Those are the ones that go and fight and die. And I think there is a massive difference between having somebody that's going to be someone in your family that's going to be sent to the front lines. And we're talking, I mean, again, the killing fields of Eastern Europe. This is, again, Russia in winter. You do not want to attack Russia in winter. There's a little, little bit of historical precedent there. If you, you know, if you, you want to go back to Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, it doesn't go well. But for the elites, uh, they ha it's, it's something of a parlor game for them. So they can sit around, sipping their cocktails, go to the country club and say, well, did you hear that our forces are off in the east fighting the czar, this, you know, this new czarevich Vladimir Putin, and uh, we are attacking him, we're decimating his troops for the glory of America. And it's, to them, it's, it's, it's a game. It's like, you know, like most people would talk about, you know, their you know, who's, uh, you know, how the playoffs are going for the NFL right now, right? Oh, you know, the Packers, what an upset, and Rodgers at the last minute, so heartbreaking, and the Niners, and then is Brady going to do, right? You know, you know, the normal people might talk about sports. This is the way the elites talk about warfare, because to them, it is just kind of a parlor game. And so they're pushing that from that perspective, because it gives them meaning and purpose. Then you also have massive, absolutely massive defense contractors who, by the way, are going to get paid whether or not shots are fired, because whenever you have Navy deployments, whenever you have military deployments, whether you have um, private military contractors, which are essentially modern mercenaries, Stephen Pressfield's done a lot of writing on this, that are, by the way, operating over there in Ukraine right now. We've got American former special forces operators that are operating under private military contracts in Ukraine, in those areas like the Donbass, uh, these Luhansk, uh, provinces where they're, you know, essentially they have separatists, they have fighting the people there and the people in that part of, of East 
Eastern Ukraine, people got to realize these borders have been crossed and moved and gone back and forth for 500 years, right? These, this is a border dispute that's been going on long before any of us have been alive. Now, the most recent border was drawn by the Soviets in as the Soviet Union was falling in 1991. And so they said, well, the border is just going to be here. And then, of course, the Soviet Union dissolved and there were all sorts of these lingering issues. Like, so biggest example, obviously, is that Russia is Crimea. So a Crimea was given to Ukraine, but Russia had a massive naval base in Crimea that they were never, ever going to give up. This is the Black Sea Fleet's home port at Sevastopol. This is their access to warm water. This is their access to the Mediterranean. Just look on a map. Russia is never going to give that up. And for years and years, they had had a deal with Ukraine that gave them access to that base. But then when Ukraine started acting like they were going to take away that deal when they joined NATO, which obviously would have been since NATO is an explicitly anti-Russia military alliance, of course, that would have threatened their base. So what does Putin do? He goes in and shores up Crimea. I mean, this is just yeah. basic geopolitics, right? It's if you look at it from the perspective of you know, what does Russia want? Well, they want access to the water, right? That for Russia is a predominantly, they're not a landlocked country, but they're kind of like a landlocked country. If you actually look at their sea access point, so they, you know, to get to the Mediterranean, they have to go through the Black Sea. To get to the Black Sea, they have to go through Crimea, which means they have to have good relations with Turkey, which controls the Bosphorus Strait. That's number one. If they want to get to the North Sea, right, they've got to go through the straits between Denmark and Sweden because that's the only way out of the Baltic. And then if you want to go anywhere north, like Murmansk, you're, you're in the Arctic at that point, which you can only use that for a couple of months out of the year. So they are very dependent on their sea access, not just for military uh, uh, operations, but also for their commerce, for being, being able to sell. That's why pipelines obviously are such a big deal, the Nord Stream 2 to them, because now they, are, they have the ability to ship their natural gas, which is their comparative resource of, um, of economic advantage for Europe because they're selling it out. And at the same time, you know, you've got people like Greta Thunberg out there running around saying, well, we can't have nuclear, we can't have all of these other things. So, you know, Germany can't do nuclear. Uh, France has to stop their nuclear. All the other parts of Europe have to stop their nuclear. So, of course, Putin is sitting there saying, great, good, good, good for me. Good for Putin. Right. So if you actually look at some of the underlying and, you know, right, they're heating their homes in Germany in the dead of winter with Russian gas. So obviously that is going to color a lot of the decisions that are being made by the EU, by Germany, by France and others. Well, it, it's, it's an interesting situation. And what worries me, too, it sounds like in so many ways is that Putin's not going to let go of that. Area. Like he, he they need it. He's going to hold on. But it worries me because you mentioned it is that the uh, defense contractors, you know, and defense contractors that have a big investment, in it, the elites that want it. But it seems like that's where a lot of that tension. Do you think that it could escalate? This could escalate into something a lot bigger. Do you think this could escalate? You know, there's that trending word, that ha that World War Three uh, talk on Twitter. Do you think that something like that could this could escalate into something bigger? Well, I mean, certainly escalation is always a worry when you have tensions rising like this. And of course, you know, the the obvious answer is, you know, what happens if there's a mishap? What happens if a gun goes off on either side and someone gets hit and someone is killed? Right. What happens? if one of these private military contractors, someone who is potentially a US passport holder gets killed or captured in one of these things, or you know, a shell that's fired off by some separate, remember the same area where we lost that, uh, that Malaysian airplane, MH17, a few years back. So it has been an area where miscalculation has occurred. Now, of course, during, that, during the MH17 shoot down, because apparently these uh, separatists thought it was a uh, either a Ukrainian jet or, you know, who knows what they thought it was, right? They shoot this thing down. It's obviously a civilian airliner. Now, there were people who were clamoring for an attack on those separatists because of this. But I think people really looked at that and cooler heads prevailed and said, look, that is going to start kick off something like an Archduke Franz Ferdinand moment. We don't need that. We've gone through World War One. And that's why, by the way, you're seeing the French, the Germans, the Russians and the Ukrainians are meeting in Paris this week, the leaders of continental Europe, because they realize that they've been through the Napoleonic Wars, they've been through World War I, they've been through World War II, they've gone through the trenches, they've gone through the killing fields, they don't been there, done that, don't want to see it happen again. So they're trying to figure out the best way to do this peacefully rather than going to arms. So I'm going to give you a hypothetical question. We get in a time machine, we've transformed 20, 30, 40 years into the future, let's say 40 years in the future. 
where's America and where are we at globally uh, with China, with Russia, with all these big mm-hmm. major countries? What, where are we heading right now? You know, America is clearly in a mode of decline. And whereas China is on the rise, Ray Dalio of Wall Street has said that, Bridgewater. Um, Charlie Munger has said that, who works with Warren Buffett, of course, the Oracle of Omaha. And so the real question is, do we allow this to continue? Do we continue to underwrite China's rise? And in doing so, uh, certainly, if, we're, if we continue demonizing Russia, they are just going to be pushed directly into the arms of China that is building their own system. And their system is called One Belt, One Road. And the EU right now, it's kind of a jump ball because the EU is looking at the situation saying, you know, we've been kind of under the American thumb since the end of the war. We're looking to get out of it. And I'll tell you right now, the EU is cutting deals with the CCP. The EU is cutting deals with Russia. You can see that with the gas. They're looking at a post-American hegemonic world. And it looks like the new hegemon is going to be the CCP. So if that takes, if that takes place and we don't have this kind of, you know, just, just awakening of people, of the citizenry to say, you know, I want to turn this down. We don't want to have hollowed out cities anymore, hollowed out countries. We don't want to have an economy that's just based on the GDP. We actually want to have manufacturing, we want to have infrastructure. We don't want to just be consumers of cheap CCP goods in the future while we're plugged into our Oculus, getting our latest, you know, booster or whatever it is, um, you know, playing around in, in the metaverse, the Zuckerverse, right? We actually want to be, you know, have sustainable actually sustainable communities, have sustainable families, be able to have that family formation that millennials and Zoomers are having tr- are struggling with so much right now because of the massive debt, because of the, f- the financial crisis 2008, and now the, uh, the COVID-19 lockdowns for Zoomers. So it, it, all of this was done by policy. That's, that's basically my, my bottom line there. All of this was done by policy. It could easily be turned around if people just ask for it. They step up and demand an actual economic decoupling from China. And you're starting to hear a little bit more of this um, but I haven't seen very much. I mean, people like P- Peter Navarro, Dr. Navarro have talked about this and have looked at tariffs on Chinese companies, CCP companies doing business in the United States. We're also seeing semiconductor plants being built in places like Phoenix um, in conjunction with uh, Taiwanese semiconductor plant, uh, prefab manufacturing facilities. So I think these are good developments, but I don't know if it's too little, too late. I mean, it's, it's simple, right? We've underwritten the rise of the CCP. The Beijing Olympics are about to take place next week. Uh, February 4th, the kicked off Lunar New Year, Chinese New Year. And this is a coronation ceremony for Xi Jinping. He's about to be named in November of this year as chairman for life. The CCP has not had a chairman for life since their original chairman, Chairman Mao. So this is absolutely this is a world significant moment. And so the question is, are we going to be going into the century of the CCP or are we going to be going into the century of freedom? Very interesting. The idea of America going in decline, that that's kind of freaks me out, I'm not gonna lie. That's kind of just a scary thought. Can you expand a little bit? You, you kind of went into it, but what, in a deeper way, what can we do to, to prevent such decline? I mean, I guess militarily, but also just in turn, I mean, domestically, I mean, you kind of went into it and I mean, there is some good signs, but as a cultural, do, do we need to, what, how do we step up to, to prevent such a, this from happening? So in, a, in a broad sense, and, and obviously, there's a, like you say, that's a huge idea to unpack, but in, you know, there's a reason that American culture is stagnated, right? There's a reason that everything Hollywood culture tur- turns out now is either a remake or a reboot right. or a sequel Awful. or a prequel or something that's remade, right? Because our culture is in stagnancy right now, the same way that we're experiencing stagflation in the economy. And that's because uh, you know, I say this all the time. The CCP plays to win and we just play, right? We just play around. We, get, we, we find things to get mad about. Um, we make up problems. We make up crises to be very worried about and very shocked about. But then we don't actually deal with the things that are happening right now. We don't talk about the fentanyl that's pouring over our border um, that's being produced by China. We don't talk about the rampant violence in our city. Our cities are in complete death spiral right now. Uh, homicides that are completely up all over across the map, right? A, a, a congresswoman's car was just shot in that, St. Louis. Yeah. And it wasn't some kind of, it wasn't some kind of targeted shooting. It was just general crime right. that takes place in our cities right now. So it, we, you know, we've got, we have train robberies again in Los Angeles, right? We we've been having that, yeah. bank robberies and carjackings here in Washington, DC. And so the question is, you know, why are we allowing this? Why are we allowing what were once the greatest cities in the world to go through this death spiral? And at the same time, why are we allowing this hollowed out economy 
to uh, essentially take over our lives. Well, it's just easier. This, this whole idea of a globalized uh, economy that we don't need a manufacturing sector in the United States, it's ridiculous. It's folly, right? It's a failure. I think everyone understands that. So we need to now look back at America as a place that people care about, a place that's our home that needs to be defended and that needs to be produced well, right? If you talk to any of these, you know, libertarians, this is where I disagree with them because a lot of this, a lot of corporate America just looks at countries as, you know, you're just another consumption market. So consume this product, consume that product, movie to, comes out, movie goes here. You know, movies are a great uh, example of this. So a movie is just meant for everywhere all the time, all at once, right? That's how they look at you. They look at you as a consumer. So we have to dial it back and we have to make made in America actually mean something again. And the way to do that, unfortunately, uh, I think for a lot of conservatives, a lot of people out there that say, well, I don't like government solutions. The way to do this is to use the power of the federal government to come in and say, we need to cool this down a little bit. It's gotten out of control. We need to rebuild our industry here at home. And the best way to do that is through the power of tariffs, through the power of economic leverage. And I guarantee you, by the way, that is the exact same thing. The inverse of that, of rebuilding our industry at home, is that it is going to slow down the growth of the CCP abroad. Stop underwriting it. Yeah, 100%. When I listen to you and I see you on Twitter, you just seem so reasonable. You seem like such a reasonable person. <laughs> and you know, you in the left and so many other people, your critics in so many ways, kind of write you off, uh, misinformation. Why is there such a, just such, why are we living, I guess, in a way, such polarizing times? Well, you, you know, and I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't compare myself to, um, yeah. uh, to him, but it's, you, you're seeing Joe Rogan kind of go through exactly, the same thing yeah. right now, right? Where, you know, he's just a guy who has a podcast and said, hey, I, I want to bring some guests on and have some conversations and, you know, kind of try to figure out what's going on in the world. And, uh, give an opinion from, from their perspective. And that's the exact same thing I do. But the difference is, and it's as you just said, because we came up through the power of social media or through podcasting and through these non-traditional media methods, right? Remember, the media is, is a click. The media is elites, you know, to be uh, brought in, to be ushered in to the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, CNN, right? These are considered highly prestigious elite appointments. Whereas, you know, you go to social media, and it costs maybe maybe 50 bucks if you want to start a podcast. The barrier to entry is so low. Uh, the barrier for you know starting a blog, starting a Twitter account, starting a Getter account, it's practically zero. Rumble page, you can start one up in seconds, right? And so because that has all come down, it has democratized information and it's given people the ability to come up through that if they do the work and if they put in the work. I'm actually coming up on uh, uh, this May. I've been on Twitter for 10 years. Wow. And, uh, you know, just plugging away, doing this stuff. And it's, it's a place really, it's created an actual, by the way, market of meritocracy, where rather than being brought into these institutions, because, you know, you knew somebody or daddy knew somebody, or, um, you know, you had a, a good last name. It's no, who does the work? Who's out there grinding every day? Who has, and just basically who has good takes, who has analysis that provides people with value? Um, who has info, value, entertainment, et cetera, right? Those are the skills that you need. And that's why when you see these people from TV that, that try to cross over, when you see like Dr. Oz or Fareed Zakaria go on a Joe Rogan or go on any of these, they completely fall apart. They completely fall apart because they are products of their environment. Uh, they have scripts. They have teams of people that are providing them with information. But, you know, Sanjay Gupta goes on uh, Joe Rogan, and he's asking him these questions about ivermectin. I said, why would you, why would you lie about me? And he, he can't even answer the questions yep. because he's never actually considered any of these things. You know, the podcast is the new pamphlet, basically. The podcast is the new pamphlet. Well, and it's expanding, it's getting bigger, and it's, I think it's going to be the future. So final they can't question. can't stop it. No, absolutely. That's what kills them. They can't stop it. They can't stop it. Uh, final question. Um, and I like to end my show usually on this, and that's, what is your message of hope and what do the American people can still believe in and have hope in for, for the future? Well, you know, one thing for me is I'm, I'm a Christian I'm a believer. I always say believe in God, you know, put your, put your faith, put your trust in God, not in man. Uh, that's always number one. Um, be a rebel, start a family. If you go and you have a family, if you have a good connection with the Lord, then you know your meaning, you know your purpose, and you're not going to throw yourself into 
uh, the work of the day or get so down about what's going on in the world because you know who wins in the end and it's us, it's not them. And you know that there is judgment and that you know, and, and that you, you tremble for your country because you know that the Lord is just, but at the same as Thomas Jefferson once famously said, but you also understand that, you know, one thing that I've always said that once becoming a father, it, it, it just changes the way you look at things because your job is for them now. You live for they, you, yourself. You know, you're 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 yesterday's news. You're old news now, right? Now it's about them. It's about setting them up for success and trying to get your society to a point where they can be successful. But at the same time, you know, you know that is your purpose and that is your meaning, not some you know far off war in a country that most people you know talking about have never even heard of. Yeah. Jack, thank you so much for coming by. We really appreciate you taking out the time. All right. God bless, Nick. Appreciate it. Thanks.